Okay, so this talk is going to be about learning in the presence of label noise. So if you were at the, um, the talk last Friday, or I talked about our method about that, uh, you might, you'll have seen some of what's in this already, but I will, uh, I'll skip over those bits probably quickly, quickly and, and talk about the other bits and what other people have done here as well, right? So some of these slides I'll just skip through quickly because you'll have seen it before from the last one. Um, so credits for these slides, uh, a lot of this was developed by postdoc uh, Diego Ortega in Dublin City University. Um, so here's, here's the sort of menu what we're going to talk about. So I'll just start off by introducing the problem again, uh, to remind you, uh, give the definition of the problem and then talk about some approaches to solving it. And this was the one that we developed, so you can see there's a few other ones there as well. Um, and I know I kind of went quickly through some of the ideas the last time, so maybe I get to spend a bit more time on them this time. Um, okay, so what's the idea? Well, basically, we've done a lot in, in and probably most of the uh, progress in computer vision at the moment has come from the ImageNet challenge, right? So, uh, because this was a, a very big data set, um, strongly labeled, so very confident, very good in the la labels, um, it allowed us to train um, classifiers that do very well and actually outperform humans, right? So, what do I mean by outperform humans? Well, uh, how can a data set labeled by a human you know, be outperformed by a machine? That, that seems a bit weird. Well, the data set was la labeled in a particular way where people only had to make binary decisions, right? This is either a cat or not a cat, right? Uh, that's not, not so difficult, right? Um, whereas this is, a, this is a referent, this reference human here, which is actually Andre Karpathy, he had to label the images uh, by basically selecting one of a thousand categories for each image, right? Much more difficult to do. And you have to know a lot about breeds of dogs and various things to do good at, at ImageNet because there's 160 breed of, breeds of dogs in ImageNet, which is kind of a strange data set. We all use it for, for, for a lot of things, but uh, it's kind of a strange data set. So we have really done well on this data set. And to a certain extent, because of this, uh, we can solve many visual tasks very well, right? So basically, we just, you know, to any, any visual task, we just construct a large scale data set, right? specify a loss and we train a model, right? And then we can do that well. And if the, the tasks are quite near to ImageNet, we can pre-train on ImageNet, right? And that will help us out as well. So that's, that's pretty good. But the question that comes up is, is there any alternatives to strong supervision for training? And there is, uh, one is self-supervised learning. So this is the stuff where you invent some surrogate task, right, that you train on instead of the task you care about. And hopefully you learn features that will work well for the other tasks. So, uh, one of the ones that's popular recently is predicting image rotations. So, you know, you, you get an image and you can rotate it in various different ways, right? You can rotate it in four different ways that, like, you know, make sure you have no warping. So you can basically 90, 180, 270, right? So that's a four-way classification task with four targets. And you've got to predict which way the image has been rotated. And, you know, you can think about it and you go, okay, well, to be able to predict what way the image is rotated, I have to understand about something about the orientation of objects in the world, right? So I need to know at least something about the structure of objects. And that actually turns out to be quite good at getting uh, to learning features is one of the best ways of doing self-supervised learning at the moment. So, so that's interesting. But another way you can do it is, is somehow get labels automatically, right? So either collect them from like uh, Google images or you can collect them from surrounding text or you know, scrape them from the web or get Mechanical Turk people to, to label things for you, but don't check it too thoroughly or, you know, use another algorithm to, to label them for you that's not, that's not as good as the algorithm that you want to train, okay? So we can easily get labels that are weak and, and noisy as well. That's not so expensive. So the scenario when you're learning what label noise looks like this. Um, so every image is labeled, but we know only some proportion of the labels and we don't know which ones are the good ones. And the relationship with semi-supervised learning is that, again, uh, there are some things that we don't know the labels for, but in the case of semi-supervised learning, it's a little bit easier because we know what, what the, we, we have a subset of them that we are confident the labels are correct in, right? So we know which ones are the labels we can trust, essentially. Okay, so a question that came up the last time I was talking about this was different types of label noise. So uh, I'm gonna talk about two different types of label noise, at least in this one. So, there's the uniform in-distribution label noise, right? That means that every um, example has equal probability of being corrupted, right? So every class is equally likely to be, you know, an image from any class is not more likely to be corrupted than any other label, right? 
and then uh, the target of that corruption could be any other class, right? So there's no structure in the noise. Um, and then there's the other one is non-uniform distribution of label noise, and that's when you have some sort of either either known or unknown, probably unknown, some matrix, right, that says that I'm of this class. What's the probability that I get my label corrupted to this class or this class or this class or this class, right? So uh, in this case, this one is likely to be be flipped with this one here, right? So you can see see those kind of things. So a, a, a matrix called a noise transition matrix kind of governs um, what way the labels are interchanged. And then there's a slightly harder situation, I think, that is out of distribution label noise, and that's the case where you have images that aren't even in your task that are kind of mixed in there, right? So it, you can imagine that you're trying to do um, a dog and cat classification, and someone throws in a few few pictures of elephants, you know, to confuse you, and, and has them labeled as dogs, right? So the, the target, the label that they actually have is is, is the, the true label is not even in your data set. It's totally different. You don't know anything about it, right? So that's a bit harder. So how do you get data for doing this? If you say, okay, well, I'm interested in, in label noise task because I've got some problems that have you know, label noise and I'd like to, to get good at this kind of thing. Uh, where, do you, where do you get the data? Well, luckily, label noise is easy to generate, right? Because you just take a clean data set and then you corrupt some of the labels, right? So you can easily generate as much of this data as you want and you can make it as corrupted as you want from 5% you know, label noise up to 95% label noise, no problem. So people have done a lot of experiments with this using some of the simpler data sets. Uh, MNIST isn't so useful for this task, but you know, CIFAR 10, CIFAR 100, they're kind of good ones to, to experiment with uh, simple approaches and see if they work, and then hopefully try to scale them up to something like ImageNet later on, right? Because you can, do, you can of course, group the images and, and ImageNet as well. What if you want to try it out in a realistic scenario? Well, here's two realistic label noise data sets. There's the clothing 1 million data set, um, which has 1 million tra training images but noisy labels, right? And that means that these aren't uniform noise as well, right? There's some noise transition matrix. You don't know what it is, but it's there, right? Um, and there is a clean set, though. They give you some clean data to at least compute your validation error on and stuff like that. You don't always have that. In some cases, you do. And in this case, they give it to you. Web Vision is another one. Very, very large data set for people who like large problems and have lots of GPUs. This one's 16 million training images and noisy labels as well, right? So uh, we haven't done much work on web vision yet, but we have done work on clothing one billion. Okay, so what's the problem look like, right? Well, standard image classification problem looks like this, right? We have, we want to learn some model, right, which I'm going to call H, right, for a hypothesis function, right? It's parameterized by some theta, which are your parameters. It takes in some image X, right? Um, and we want to train it based on some paired examples, right? This is just a standard classification problem, right? Um, and we usually optimize something like cross-entropy, right? In the label noise case, the difference is that our, our labels may be incorrect, right? And if our sample has an incorrect label, we call that a noisy label, and the corresponding X is, or, the, or the pair X, Y, we call a noisy sample, okay? That's just a bit of terminology. And what happens if you try to just take the standard cross-entropy thing and, and, and train it with this is you'll fit the noise, right? So you'll basically fit the noisy labels, which you can see here, and that usually happens after you reduce the learning rate. Um, keeping the learning rate high kind of prevents you from fitting the noise for a little while, but uh, you know, it won't let you learn the, the, the real data very well either. Uh, so how do, we, how do we fix this? Well, the earliest approach to, to doing this was something called bootstrapping. Um, so let's see, get an intuition to how that works, right? So here's our standard, um, our standard CNN that we're training with cross entropy. And here's an example that's not been labeled correctly. The label on it is car, but the real label on this is elephant, right? And if we just, you know, use a single loss where we try to do cross entropy with car, that's going to guide the network in the wrong direction for this, right? But one of the things we can hope for, if, if everything was nice and our net network had learned a lot from other examples, is that in fact its prediction might be better than our label, right? In fact, it might predict elephant for this. So if somehow we could you know, use the prediction of the network itself, then maybe we could indeed learn from these examples. Okay. Um, so the idea is let's make a loss, right? It's some combination of the standard cross entropy loss with the, with the actual label and uh, the loss that we would have with our own prediction. And then you might say, well, the loss that we have with our own prediction is going to be zero, right? Because 
you know, that's our prediction. But actually, you know, that's not true because you can take your prediction and then, you know, take the arg max of it, right? So then, unless your, your, your model is completely confident, which it won't be, right, unless it's putting one there and zeros everywhere else, then it, w it will still get a, a signal. In other words, just make it stronger prediction towards that. So that, that's, so it's not, this will be like, you take your prediction and then you somehow strengthen it and then you use that, okay? And strengthen it could be by, by taking the arg max, for example. Okay, so what does it look like? Well, in practice, like, you have this, yeah, this is your standard cross entropy loss where there's a lot of suspicious white space put in because I'm going to fill things in in it. And then we basically do this combination of our, our target and our ground truth, right? And that's, that's bootstrapping, right? And the original bootstrapping paper basically used a fixed W to control uh, the amount of boot, the amount of, um, the amount of bootstrapping or the strength of the bootstrapping that's applied, right? So, it doesn't care about what the examples look like. It will always sort of trust its own prediction about, with about strength of about 0.2 and the ground truth with about 0.8, right? So that, that kind of helps a little bit, but it's not great. Um, you can do soft bootstrapping as well where you, you soften the predictions and then you need a different, a need a different threshold. Uh, but it does help, right? So this is bootstrapping. So here we fit the noise very quickly, and here it keeps it as apart, kept us apart for a bit longer. So this, this sounds like a good progress step in the right direction. Okay, so that was, that was one of the earlier approaches to doing, um, working with noisy labels. Um, but what if our noise is structured, right? That we have this matrix and we somehow, maybe we know something about that matrix. What can we do then? Um, so this is a matrix here that is our, we're gonna call our noise transition matrix, right? And in numbers, it looks something like this, okay? So if you look at the rows, the rows in this matrix sum to one, so it's a stochastic matrix, okay? Uh, and basically, you know, this is, if you are, you know, this particular class, you have about 0.3 per, uh, probability of being labeled that class and 0.7 probability of being labeled the other class. You know, and this bottom one here is definitely gonna be labeled the right class, right? And some of the other ones may not be, right? That's if you look at a row. And if you look at a column, then it's not doesn't need to sum to one, but you can basically say that, you know, this is a chance of getting labels co incoming into that classroom from other areas. Okay, so uh, in the forward loss correction paper, they basically propose to put W transpose in here, right? So this is this is your network prediction, the output of a softmax. Okay, um, and basically this says that if you predict a one in in say this location here. What you really predicted is a 0.7 here and a 0.3 here, right? That we're going to correct the loss to say that, right? Because that's the proportion of the data set. You shouldn't be really confident that there's a one there because, you know, in your data set, we know that there's some problems with the labels and about, you know, 70% of the time that actually should go, that, that energy should go somewhere else, right? The W transpose just basically plucks a column out of that if this was a one hot. It's not a one hot, then it's going to take some combination of the columns, right? But basically it'll correct the noise. So that's called a forward method, right? And then there's another method in the same paper, it's called the backward method, where they basically try to undo the transition matrix directly. So you just multiply by W inverse, right? That's another way of, of doing this as well. And they both work out about the same. Um, okay, that's, that, that's fine, but how do we get W, right? I mean, it's not like somebody usually comes over with a noisy data set and hands you a W matrix and says, okay, here you go, here's the perfect W matrix for you. Um, so we need to estimate it in some way. Um, so you can think about a couple of ways that you might go about estimating it. Uh, but the way that they suggest in the original uh, forward loss correction uh, paper is pretty interesting, right? So um, here's the idea, right? The idea is that the output of the softmax, if we, get, if, we, if we could find a perfect example of a class, right? So let's say we have, you know, we, Apple is one of the classes that we're interested in. And we have this really pristine, perfect Apple somewhere, right? That's gonna give us like, as much appleiness as we can get from our, our classifier, right? Then we could look at the probabilities uh, output by the rest of the softmax, and they would tell us how much noise is going to be transitioned to the other 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 uh, classes, right? Why? They would basically tell us a row of W. The reason being is that you know that pristine example, if it's if you train it on the on the noisy data. Right, the, the classifier will learn that even for the best possible example of Apple, I still have some percentage of probability I need to put somewhere else to, to minimize my loss, right? And so you actually get the right thing out of it. Of course, 
just assumes these perfect examples. So what you do in practice is you search for the best example of a particular topic in your data set. So you have Apple, you search through all your images to find the one that makes the Apple classifier, like the Apple output of the softmax really happy, makes it really high, and then you use that as a row in your W, okay? That's essentially what they do here, okay? So you don't need any clean set or anything like that to do it, right? You can just train on your noisy data, estimate your W matrix from this, and then go back and do the loss correction stuff, like start training again, right? That's, that's the idea, what they say. Um, there's a follow-up paper called Gold Loss Correction, um, and what they do here is exactly the same thing. They just estimate the, the W matrix slightly differently, and probably more intuitively, but it needs a clean set. That's the, that's the only drawback. Usually that's not a big deal, though, right? You can spend a couple of hours cleaning up a small set of the data, right? That, that's usually not too big a deal. So what they basically say to do is that you take your corrupted data and you train the model on that, same way as we did beforehand, right? But then we have this holdout clean set that we, we've kept aside, and we use that uh, clean set to estimate the, the W, right? Basically, you can look at the average output of the softmax for each of the classes. So for every, like, for Apple, we look at all of the, the average of, on, on your clean set of, of Apple, take all of the softmaxes, out, average them together, and that gives you a row of W then. Okay, so that's another way of estimating it. And that way it turns out to be a bit better, right? So you can see here, this is as, as your noise level is going up, um, and then this is basically, this is not this is error, so we want it to stay low, and our error kind of scales a little bit better when we use that method. So th basically this method works pretty well, but it's really contingent on knowing this W matrix, right? So the better you can estimate it, the better it works. Uh, I mentioned mix-up before, uh, but just to have an illustration as to why mix-up might work. So to remind you, with mix-up, basically, we mix the inputs to get this sort of thing where the in two, two inputs are sort of overlaid on one another. And then we also mix the losses, right? So the losses, uh, so our losses are a combination of the losses of both of them, right? So here's a dog and a person, and then we get this kind of fady dog person thing, right? And that's... that's uh, mix up right and in general you know there's this little delta mixing parameter um, usually that's sort of sampled from a better distribution right and you can configure that better distribution in different ways depending on, on uh, what, what the problem is but for for this kind of problem I think it's usually set to somewhere where it's there's a lot of probability in the middle basically so you're, you're almost mixing half and half every time okay um, so we've seen this figure before uh, but here's the intuition that I wanted to show. So um, here's basically the optimistic case, right? So this is, we're doing uh, binary classification, okay? Uh, so this is kind of easy, optimistic case. It's not going to work out like this, but it gives an intuition. Uh, and suppose on the left we have the, we, we do, we're doing mix-up and we have two clean labels, right? So we have a dog and a person, and then, you know, our mix-up does the same thing as it normally would do, mixes them together, and then we end up with a loss that we want, we want some bit of the classifier to say dog and some bit of it to say person, and that's kind of makes sense, okay? But what happens if one of our, our samples is noisy, right? So in this case, we've got dog and dog instead of dog and person, okay? So actually, things aren't so bad then, right? Because our loss now, uh, it, it contains a person, right, still, but our loss is still only half wrong, right? It's not completely wrong. It's just going to guide it towards dog, which isn't really too bad, right? And similarly, symmetrically, in this case, if they're both labeled person, it'll just guide it towards person and our mixed input contains a person still. And what, what if they're both wrong? Well, in the binary classification case, that's great because <laughs> you just swap the labels, right, and you still get exactly the same as the clean case, right? Now, that doesn't happen, obviously, when you've got more classes unless you get very lucky and you've got two classes just interchanging, but that can happen sometimes and then you end up with the right labels no matter what, right? So it's still, it still uh, kind of helps to, to correct it. Um, and if you try and mix up, you kind of get this figure here which is nice, right, because it stays separated for longer. But our blue loss takes a good, a good while to go down. Um, and this is the one that I showed the last day. So just to recap, what we basically do is use a better mixture model uh, to predict the weight for bootstrapping, right, so it's not a fixed weight anymore. Um, and when you do that, you get this nice separation, right. You can combine this with mix-up as well to get even better performance. Um, so this is the basically the bootstrapping equation, and then we use WI from our beta mixture model. And that's what happens when you add mix-up on top of it, okay? Um, 
And I showed these already, so this works pretty well. And this is the nice figure that you can say that we went from a data set that was very, very corrupt to one that was quite clean, right? So we went from, you know, 80% error to 13% error. That's pretty good. The code for that is on GitHub. Um, so there's a couple of other simple ones that I want to just mention as well because these are kind of uh, what, you, what you might think of when you're thinking about this sort of stuff as well. Uh, and they, they work to a certain extent. So one is relabeling, right? So this is the idea that, well, what we'll do is we'll just train a classifier on the corrupted set or, and then just try relabel the data with the outputs of the classifier, okay? So just believe the classifier after a while more than your ground truth and just relabel, okay? That's, that's a pretty simple idea. So the idea here is you pre-train the network with a high learning rate, so you stop it from getting uh, learning the noise by keeping the learning rate high. And okay, it doesn't have to be that accurate on the data. But, um, and then you just relabel with the predictions. And then when you've got it relabeled, you retrain again. Right? And you can iterate doing that as many times as you want. Um, and that actually was only proposed in 2018, that simple idea. You can see our paper on it there. And it works reasonably well, actually. So it's, it's kind of a simple thing. But well, it seems to work. Um, but you need a special regularization term, which is the same one actually we need in, some, in, in very high level cases of noise and the approach that I propose. Uh, basically, for, when you're doing this label noise stuff and you start to rely on your own predictions, there's a possibility that the whole thing can collapse, right? Because basically, if, if my own predictions all start to go to zero or something like that, and then I start, you know, or they all go to the same class, right? then I'm able to like really drive down the loss by just predicting you know, that one class and ignoring the data, right? So you usually need a, a regularization term. And the one that's typically used, I haven't got it up on the slide here, but it, it's basically made to make sure that the distribution within a batch of the labels that you expect to see is what, what it should be. So if you've got equal class balance, right, that means that in any given batch, you would expect it to be given an equal amount of different types of labels to different things, okay? So you can add a term to do that, right? It's, it's not too difficult to formulate, but basically you want the distribution of the labels in each batch to be uniform, right, if, if, if they're in the data set. So that's just a little regularization term, and if you do that, it stops it. Obviously, it can't now push the loss to zero by predicting the same thing all the time because it's breaking that regularization term, right? So it stops it from cheating. And we all know that neural networks, right, if you give them any way of trying to cheat and, and minimize their loss, they will do that, right? So you often need these regularization terms to prevent that. Uh, so this is the relabeling effect, right? So here you can see, as soon as we start relabeling, our, our accuracy on the training set goes up quite a lot, so that's pretty good. But unfortunately, it doesn't generalize super well because you can see our, our validation in the orange here doesn't respond as well as we would like. So relabeling you know, certainly helps with the training error, but uh, I mean, that's obvious it would because you, know, um, you now have more correctly labeled well, more labels that agree with the predictions, so your, your training accuracy is going to go up. But not, not, not unfortunately validation. And then the final one you might think of doing is just throw away things that we think are not labeled correctly, okay? Uh, so this has the advantage, again, of simplicity. But the disadvantage is that we don't have any signal coming from them images anymore that we could learn from, okay? So if we relabel stuff, then at least we can learn from them, right? but we can't learn from anything from, from ones we throw away. But it's still worth considering. So the idea here is you get a highly probable set of clean samples, right? So assuming we have a clean set in this case, um, we can get this automatically. I'll say how to in a second or something. Yeah, get, get a highly probable set anyway automatically, not perfect one. Um, and then we just use something from semi-supervised. And so there's loads of ways of doing semi-supervised learning. So we basically transform the problem into a semi-supervised problem and use semi-supervised learning. Right? It's a good idea as well and a nice path to take. Okay. Um, so, okay, so assuming you don't have a clean set or you don't have the time to label one or whatever, is there any way of getting it automatically? Well, there's a, not, not completely clean, but one way you can think about getting it is to take a classifier, train it on the noisy set, then make predictions on the clean set, and look for places which have high confidence and the predictions agree with the labels, okay? And then that might be a highly probable clean set, right? So basically here, train a network on all the data, throw away all the samples where a prediction doesn't equal, equal the label, and then rank by our confidence, and then just take the most confident ones, right? And then that's our clean set. And that's a way of automatically generating a fairly, 
probable clean set, and then you can do semi-supervised techniques. Now, it's not going to be perfect because hard, hard examples could, might, might get omitted from that because they're the ones that are not going to look as, as clean as, as the easier ones, okay? Um, and then, yeah, there's another way of doing it. Well, I guess if there's a clean set available, you can, you can actually you can expand it, obviously, by training a binary classifier on the clean set and then applying it uh, to the data set and, and discarding noisy samples and try to make it, make it bigger. So that's, that's another way of doing it as well. Okay, so in conclusion, right, even with extreme label noise, right, which I, this was surprising for me, I think, uh, like 80% label noise, we can still train effective representations and do well in classification tasks, right? So that, you do need some tricks to get there, but it is possible to do. And that's kind of remarkable in the sense that, that's like, imagine having a, a lecture up on, you know, teaching you, and every lecture they just spend 80% 80 80 of the time telling you lies, right? Complete nonsense, right? And then they give you a test at the end of it, and you get 75% or something like that, first class honors, right? So that's basically what the equivalent is, right? And you've got no, no information from any other sources, right? So that seems pretty remarkable. And um, there are three types of approaches to this so far. The dominant one is to correct the loss in some way. And that was the paper that we developed recently we took that approach. But you can also look at trying to relabel your samples in some way or try to discard ones that aren't, aren't, uh, aren't are poss possibly or highly likely to be noisy. Um, the availability of a small, clean uh, data set is, is very useful if you can create one. And often it's, it's very good to have, at least for, for testing purposes, to see where you are. Right? So one of, the, one of the things that I didn't talk about here uh, very much is that when you're, when you're doing stuff with label noise, right, you, can't, you, you may not be able to trust a validation error if it comes from the same distribution, right? Because if, you're, if your labels in the validation set can't be trusted as well, right, then you don't know what is, is driving this validation error all the way down good? I don't know, because maybe I'm fitting the noisy labels, probably am, right? Um, so we actually spend a bit of effort in, in our work making a method that you don't really have to worry too much about convergence, right? You just stop after some 300 epochs and it will be good, right? You don't have to have a clean validation set to be able to pick that there. But if you do have a clean validation set, that's great because then you can usually get a little bit more accuracy by stopping at exactly the right point, right? But what you don't want to, some, some methods, like if you don't get that right point, then you know, it'll diverge or learn the noise or something like that, right? So you kind of have to look at these factors when you're choosing something. Do you have a clean set and can you use that to, to, to get an estimate of validation? Okay. So that's all on label noise. Any questions? Yep. Yep. Okay, yeah, so the idea here is that um, we can basically, we have a clean set of data. Um, so we can look at like training some binary classifier to say whether a, a label pair is, is correct, right? So, it, so for each class, we can train a binary classifier to say whether something is noisy or not, right? And then you just apply that binary, binary classifier. So it's a binary classifier because you, you can do it for, for each, you have to do it for each class, right? So, so that just, just to give you the confidence that it, it's actually cleaner noise. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, uh, so we're going to go, oh, go ahead, oh, stop this.